I'm Charlena Hussein Morgan. I'm also a State Department Foreign Service Officer. I'm a Rusk Fellow here as well with Angela and um, happy to be uh, leading this series this year. And this is actually our last speaker for the fall semester and what a great way to end the fall term. And we'll be back in the spring with our next slate of speakers. So very excited for you all to be here um, before Thanksgiving and finals are upon you all. So thank you for joining us. All right, great. Well, thank you so much. Uh, Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary Pete asked Julie Chong, it's a great honor for you to have us to have you here at Georgetown University, the School of Foreign Service. Um, your bio is incredibly long. So what I do with these amazing speakers who have such an amazing deep bench of experience is I will not read the whole list because that'll take like half the video. <laughs> um, but I wanted to just make some quick highlights. Um, uh, Pete asked Julie Chong is actually um, in the our Bureau for Western Hemisphere Affairs and has been there since November 2018. Um, she has primarily split her time between our East Asia um, Affairs Bureau, our EAP Bureau, and WHA. Um, pr prior to her current um, experience in the WHA front office, she has served um, in a, as in a Deputy Chief of Mission, DCM, in Cambodia. She was Economic Counselor in Thailand. Um, and so she clearly has a deep bench of experience uh, also as a mem career member of the Senior Foreign Service. So, so great for you to be here. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, I understand you are a native of Huntington Beach, California. Um, and I love to hear the experience of those in the Foreign Service who come all the way from our West Coast because normally we hear, I'm a New Yorker, so we always hear the, you know, the- give you for, <laughs> yes, yeah. I went to the East Coast. New York. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So we normally hear the almost the like what we now call the typical experience of a foreign service officer where they're normally you know they come from like the East Coast and they go to a school in the East Coast and then they join the foreign service but your experience is uh, quite different and you started off as one of the first Pickering fellows in the Department of State and so it'd be great to just hear um, you know what your path has been um, just leading you know maybe from before you joined the State Department to kind of how it evolved over time. Well, I'm, first of all, really excited to be here. Thank you for welcoming me. I've known about this series for a long time. I'm, I was wondering when I was going to be invited. <laughs> um, but, you know, I wake up every morning and I'm so excited to go to work. And I hope the both of you in, in this room think about that. When you wake up and, and think, I have to fight through traffic, I have to get to this class, I don't <laughs> like this professor, I haven't done my reading. Do you really think about, I get to go to Georgetown, yeah. or I know there's other students, I get to go to AU, I get to go to SICE today and learn. Yeah. Uh, so the excitement of everyday common things, I hope that's you know, shared within everybody in this room and those who are watching later. Um, you said I was native of California. Actually, that's not true. Oh. I'm a native of uh, South Korea. Oh, okay. So I was born in Seoul, Korea and immigrated when I was five years old with my parents and my younger sister. So at the time when we came, uh, we, my parents had one suitcase and a rice cooker because they thought they didn't have rice cookers in America <laughs> and a transistor radio. So that's, wow. that's how we came with one suitcase to uh, Long Beach, California originally. And then we moved from there to Garden Grove and then ended up in Huntington okay. Beach. Uh, but I call Huntington Beach my home and my parents and sisters still live. Uh, so it was a scary time as an immigrant. Uh, I remember going into the U.S. Embassy in Seoul and my mother tells me this, I don't remember, but you know, she said there was this young kid, basically uh, a young blonde lady with a ponytail and she was going to decide the fate of our lives. And thank goodness she issued our immigrant visa at the time. And it didn't hit upon me until much years later that now I, I'm on that other side of that visa window and thinking about the impact of our decisions and our interactions Absolutely. with to-be immigrants. Yeah. And so having that immigrant experience growing up in Southern California was very important. And growing up in a, uh, a home where my father was uh, working at the factory floor of an engineering company, even though he was a very senior engineer in Korea, had to go to night school, learn English. And my mother was a journalist in Korea and she became a, a dishwasher at an Italian restaurant. Mm. So really it's starting from scratch, the American yeah. dream. Yeah, absolutely. And um, my father worked his way up in this engineering company from the factory floor to a drafter, to engineer, senior engineer, mid-level manager. And he's actually now the CEO and president mm -hmm. of the engineering company where he started wow. off at the very bottom at the minimum wage that's level. Amazing. And that's the American dream, right? right? That's insane. I mean, I think about that and that is 
those stories are what make not only the State Department, but our American society and our fabric so strong. Um, my parents' experience is so similar, and it's so great to see that that evolution is so um, uh, emblematic of our American, American story. Um, so, so then how did you find yourself wanting to embark on a career of diplomacy when you were out in beautiful Southern California, where I would never leave the beaches? Um, for for this kind of path, what intrigued you about about this? I went to UC San Diego, okay. and at the time, I watched a lot of LA Law. <laughs> so, and that's dating myself. I know. I, I thought like, I that show to be does, a lawyer. That's that's, that's <laughs> when you know if you know what that show is. Yeah, those of you who laugh, thank you. Uh, I watched LA Law, and I thought I want to be a lawyer. I want to be a high-powered lawyer in Southern California. That sounds fun. Um, and then a part of me wanted to be a journalist. I was on the school paper in high school and college as well. So I was kind of torn between law and journalism. Mm -hmm. uh, and I was studying political science and Japanese studies. And I did uh, my sophomore year abroad in, in Japan, and doing a, a live with the family out in the provinces of Saitama. And then one day I was just walking around campus, and I think the Career Center had a, a flyer up uh, about um, what was originally called the Woodrow Wilson Foreign Affairs Fellowship, now called the Pickering, Pickering. Fellowship. Mm. I thought, oh, that sounds interesting. So I went to the information session. And I thought, okay, I can write stuff, I can travel, I can see the world, learn languages. That sounds pretty good. Yeah. And they're looking for diverse uh, candidates. And so I applied. And this was the inaugural year. This was an experiment for the State Department to think about uh, diversifying uh, their ranks. And at first, that first year, there were 10 of us. And I think right now, it's of the original cohort, I think there's only two or three left. left yeah. So there were 10 of us in that inaugural um, you know, class. class, and we were trying to learn as we go. We were the beginning yeah. pigs. Yeah. So we first started, they, they introduced us to this thing called the Foreign Service, which I didn't have much exposure about. <laughs> um, again, to Asian American parents, and those who are yes. Asian American, you know, yes. you know, yes. Oh, yeah. You have to be a lawyer or a doctor. Yeah, there's no other. Um, you know, maybe an engineer, engineer but maybe. yeah, anything other science. social sciences yeah. were a little bit worrisome. Yeah. So they weren't sure what this was all about, this foreign service. Did they understand eventually what you were doing? Eventually. Okay. Um, My but parents they still were don't supportive understand. because it came with a scholarship. So oh, that yes, helped. Yes, with yes. The yes. Wilson. <laughs> uh, so I joined and then we had a summer orientation and a domestic internship where I did an EUR in the European Bureau, and then I did an internship abroad in Bonn, Germany, of all places. I thought I would maybe try out Europe, and yeah. that would be my area of specialty. So anything that you think you intend to do and life right. turns out differently, yes. it's okay. You it's okay. go on that journey. Yeah, absolutely. And so it's, um, again, what I thought I was originally was interested in, journalism and law to foreign service and not doing Europe and uh, not doing Asia initially. Um, yeah. It's really the paths and the opportunities are out there, and there's so many choices. That's the best thing about the Foreign Service, and you're never bored. Yeah, no, I mean, that's absolutely correct. I mean, as I, as I think about where you started in this inaugural Pickering class, I mean, I can't even imagine, you know, a small class of 10 and where we are now. Um, you know, as your career has evolved and you've traveled all over, you've served in so many parts of the world, how do you feel that your identity, perhaps as an Asian American or a daughter of immigrants, um, yourself an immigrant, how has that identity kind of um, interplayed with your um, positions in different places? I mean, you have held, you're currently very senior here in our, our, our headquarters, but when you're overseas also, it, there's a whole different experience. Um, how did that kind of play out over your career? Do you have any kind of experiences you wouldn't mind sharing um, that over your time? That's interesting. My first tour was in Guangzhou, China, and I was a visa officer, so at the window, you know, stamping visas, hundreds of them, all by yeah. before noon. <laughs> and so it was a pretty intense job yeah. as a first tour uh, junior officer. Uh, but I remember many times when people were angry over being denied a visa, and then they would be uh, demanding to see the real American. American. Uh, and I'm sure many um, of us who uh, are Asian Americans or other ethnicities have, have dealt with that. Yes. And so I would have to say, no, I'm the American, and you're really denied a visa. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, sometimes I would go into meetings and later tours in, in Japan, and they would immediately assume that I was the, the note taker or the person who was going to serve the tea. Yeah. Uh, and so it takes sometimes our foreign kind of parts, a minute or two. Uh, even though in this day and age, you assume there, there, there are plenty of a mix of what American looks, looks like, like now. Yes. Um, 
but I didn't take that as, as an offense. I took it as an mm -hmm. opportunity. It right. was an opportunity for me to share. Right. You know, where you're really from? Okay, I'll tell you where I re I'm yeah. really from. Yeah. I am from Korea. I'm not from the United States. <laughs> right. uh, but my family came with nothing. Yeah. We had no connections, no network. Right. And uh, we were able to succeed by hard work and opportunity. Yeah. And that's what America is. And I became a diplomat. Uh, coming to this country from another country. Yeah. So I love that. I love yeah. that opening. I can't wait to tell that story. Yeah. And then to have the foreign audiences, the foreign counterparts take that in and go, huh, wow, that's, Their that's true. Their face changes over time. It does. Yeah. And it's not the same in every country. Right. Um, some countries, exactly. people are astounded that, yeah. we, again, we didn't come from generations of diplomats right. or uh, a wealthy family. Right. It's just sheer taking the test and hard work right. and opportunity. No, and I love the tale. I tell that story, and that's oh, why that's I think great. it's so important to have a diverse foreign service. No, absolutely, and I think that is um, that is exactly leading to what my next question is. And I think you're in a very unique position to really be able to tackle this in a, in a lot of different ways because of you, not only just being the first Pickering, but you have over your career done so much to actively support and foster diversity and inclusion. Um, and uh, I like to point out, um, depending on the speaker, you know. Know, their role in our State Department, uh, different employee affinity groups. You are, um, you know, a, a board member, senior um, advisor for a number of our affinity groups, including the Pickering and Wrangell Fellows Association, but also our Asian American Foreign Affairs Association, uh, PRFA and AFA. So through those experiences or just in general through your career, how have you seen, I mean, especially when you look back as when Pickering, you know, first started, how has the department evolved over time or maybe how has the foreign policy community evolved over time to do more to tackle this problem and kind of what has your perspective been so yeah. far? Well, we've come a long way. When I joined the Foreign Service in 1996, um, there wasn't much talk about mentoring and brown bags or work-life balance. Mm -hmm. I don't remember any of that. Right. Uh, it was just, you go in and do your job. Right. And uh, I think through the years, we have evolved. We have looked to the um, how we train our people, and under Colin, Secretary of State Colin Powell, a lot of focus was on leadership training, mm -hmm. and uh, how we train people, how we treat people, how we mentor the next generation. Uh, by the time I was kind of in my mid-level uh, part of my career, there was more talk about that. Right. And um, even a word, a phrase like unconscious bias was not existent in, when I, in the first half of my career. I only heard that a few years ago. So the fact that we are becoming more self-aware as an institution, that's a good thing. Yeah. And you know, there's a long way to go in terms of diversity. 50% of the Foreign Service is women. Mm -hmm. When you get to the senior ranks, that number drops drastically drops. to the 20s. Yeah. Same thing, Asian Americans, about yeah. 6%. Senior levels, it drops 3%. Why is that? I don't know the exact answer, and I think we're exploring that. We're looking at ourselves now to say, that's great, the recruitment part yeah. has been great. Right. But how do you retain, right. and how do you make sure people go all the way through the senior ranks? Right. Um, do some people self-select out? Is it lifestyle choices? Is it uh, private sector enticing us away? Right. What are the factors that weighs into this? What are what are other factors? So I think, I hope well, we continue to explore that and find solutions for that. Absolutely. And I think there's also the generational shift where maybe folks who joined the Foreign Service, you know, a few decades ago, this was the, the career forever. Yeah. And I think it's just a generational thing. It's not specific to this career path, but in general, a lot of the folks, I will try to include myself in that generation, uh, would say that, hey, there are a lot of choices out there. Maybe I like this for now, and then I'll think about something else. But I think that still, even understanding that atmosphere is important yeah, in understanding how we can do more, as you said, to retain. And I think uh, when we talk about diversity and inclusion, it's not just recruitment and getting people into the door. It's getting them into through the door, getting them at the table, and keeping them at the table and having their voices heard. Yes. Um, and that's so. been a lot of my focus, working with the Asian American Foreign Affairs Association yeah. and the Pickering Wrangell Foreign Affairs Association. You know, we get to a level where we become O1s, and then right. it's the next jump into the Senior Foreign, foreign Service. Service. Okay. And that's why I'm focusing a lot of my energy on. Mm -hmm. How do we get people, you know, not just the junior officers, which right. we do really great, and, and yeah. bringing them in and mentoring them, mm -hmm. Um, but when you get to a certain level, how do you get across that threshold yes. to the higher senior levels? Yes. Um, how do we empower? How do we mentor? How do we engage and provide the right resources right. to push it up? 
Right. Um, so I want to make sure there's more other other picking wrangles and, and a more diverse senior level, level. service right. because I'm not seeing it. And, and right. right now I sit in a lot of meetings where I'm right. the only woman, I'm the only person of color. Yeah. And um, I, again, that's continued to improve throughout the past few decades, but we need more work. No, absolutely. 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 I absolutely agree with you. So you touched a little bit about it, um, mentorship and I guess, you know, it was a concept that evolved in kind of what, as you were in your mid-level in the foreign service. Um, I was lucky to, when I joined almost nine years ago, where I came in and they asked me, do you want a mentor? Which was like, oh, wow, this is so great. Like, this is, this, this is how you should always start someone's career. Um, you, maybe could you talk a little bit about mentors or champions you've had throughout your career, maybe even before you got to state, maybe, you know, in your undergrad or education. I think for a lot of the students here, you know, sometimes um, your mentor is actually the person on campus and, and encourages you to get to where you are now. So just love to hear your experience. Yeah, I'll mention two mentors that I've had in my career and two very different people. Um, Christy Kenny, Ambassador Christy oh, Kenny, yes. three-time ambassador. I worked thing. for her in Thailand when mm -hmm. I was the economic counselor and she was the ambassador. And uh, she was the just such a force, uh, so much energy. And yeah. I learned a lot from her about connecting with people and that positive energy, mm -hmm. that optimism. And yeah. I don't mean Pollyanna optimism, yeah. it's realistic optimism, but there is something genuine that with the energy and passion that mm -hmm. she has that she brought to the job every yeah. day. Yeah. Uh, and I think I've learned to reflect some of that in my career, the rest of my career. And. I remember when I was actually pregnant um, and during my tour in Bangkok, and I was a little nervous about yeah. telling the ambassador I'm going to have to, you know, take some leave. Yeah. You know, I'm not going to be able to work my usual crazy hours. And she was just so welcoming and wow. congratulated me and said, "That's your number one priority, your family. Yeah. We will be here. We, right. you will continue to be a superstar. <laughs> um, don't worry about that." That's and I remember just being really appreciative um, as a hard charger. I felt nervous about telling my superiors about being pregnant. Yeah. Uh, and she just put me at ease right away. And again, her enthusiasm yes. for her job. My other uh, mentor I mentioned is Ambassador Bill Todd, who was the ambassador to Cambodia when I was his deputy chief of mission. And uh, he also was such a strong force in Cambodia at a very difficult time oh. when Prime Minister Hun Sen oh. was cracking down on uh, human rights and civil society. And there would be days when I, when I went to him and said, how, how do you do this in public and in private? And you're constantly named and shamed, you know, by the prime minister, um, called out and ridiculed. And he said, we do this because we love America. We're patriots. And we're going to stay steadfast. We're going to continue to do what we do. Right. So remain strong. And he just had a, such a strong sense of that North Star. Right. And he continues to mentor me to the both of them, um, Ambassador Kenny and Bill Todd, both uh, continue to mentor me to this day. No, that's so great. I think those two, and I, you know, it's funny is that I hear those two names mentioned quite often. So I think it goes to show that. And then also a name you mentioned earlier that cannot go um, unnamed is Secretary Colin Powell. I never had the amazing luck to serve with him, but there are certain leaders you hear of that you just wish you had served with them in a more direct capacity because they clearly have made such an impact. But those two threads I, I wanted to just reiterate from those two different mentors I think are so important. One is, you know, I think we have come a, a, a little bit of a ways in this department in at least um, having more, just like the diversity and inclusion conversation, at least it's out there and now we're talking about it. Same thing I would say for working moms. This is a new conversation that I also am working on in the building and it's so great to see because you received that mentorship from Ambassador Kenny. You are now doing that for so many other women in the foreign service and the civil service. Um, and so I think that's important to mention that when you learn that great um, you know, mentorship you pass it on. And I think that's a really great um, tool that we should always reiterate. Mentorship requires you learning from your mentor and then taking those lessons and replicating that. And that is the active you know, way to mentor the next generation. And I think the Ambassador Bill Todd's um, conversation with you is I think another point that is also worth mentioning is that I think a lot of people, especially when I talk to prospective students who are maybe not even in the foreign service, interested in the foreign service, but a career in foreign policy, the question is, always, well, you probably always feel like that you 100% agree with the policy or the issue all the time. And that is so far from the truth. But that doesn't 
negate my unflailing dedication to my country, right? And so I think those two things are really important to show for whoever wants to join this career. And that is, once again, something that we instill in the next generation is that it's going to be hard and you're gonna have those difficult choices, but if not you in the room, who else will be in there to ha ask those hard questions? So I, I take those two points really seriously. Those are really great. And points. I want to follow up on you know motherhood a little bit because yes, I'm a mother of a yeah. six-year-old, so a first grader. <laughs> uh, I know a lot of my colleagues have kids in college, but uh, my yeah, son is I in first a grade. One, yeah. And uh, being in the front office um, in a, in a bureau with a six-year-old is is hard. And um, again, there's no such thing as work-life balance. We can just strive to do that. Yeah. Uh, but making conscious choices, right. uh, that realizing that I can now work 15 hours every single day. Right. There are some days when I'm, I tell my staff, I'm 5.30 is my end time. Yes. Give me every paper to clear by then, and I, I'm leaving and having yeah. dinner with my family. Um, tomorrow, my family's going to come have lunch with me at the State Department right. because they have no school tomorrow. So making those small decisions and also talking about your family. Yeah. I do that a lot in my yes. staff meetings. Yes. Uh, it's, it's the day and age where you don't have to be ashamed that I have to rush out and go to the PTA and take my yeah. sick kid to the hospital. Yeah. Uh, I'm proud to say it. I say, yeah. look, uh, I, I, I overslept this morning because my son you know, was up all night with <laughs> right. a fever. Oof. So if you have to go to a, you know, take care of your child today, please do. Or today I have to go to my, my son's PTA you know, school teacher conference and I'm not gonna come back afterwards. Yeah. Um, so being able to really openly talk about that, yes. and I think that hopefully that sends a signal. If, mm -hmm. if my boss, if the front office yes, it does. feels that's okay, then it's okay. It's a safe space for my, me to spend time with my family. And of course, it's not just about people with families and children. Absolutely. It's whatever background, for single folks too, yes. you just, you need the time to be yeah. fresh Absolutely. and find that passion. Go train for a marathon or <laughs> go to a happy hour or whatever that activity is outside. Right. Um, and you have to find something that draws you and draws your passion that's not just your job. Yeah, and that in the end, I firmly 1,000% agree with you, and, I, and my argument on top of that is that makes you a better officer. Mm -hmm. That makes you better at what you do because you have that division, and I think we're slowly having the conversation, I think, in, in our area is that understanding the difference between, like, hair on fire, someone will literally die versus can this wait until tomorrow morning conversation but I can only imagine what it's like in your position I have a two-year-old and that's already hard enough so um, but that's yeah and I think normalizing the conversation about our personal lives is important because I think in the Foreign Service um, it is part and parcel um, uh, a very unique career path because we live overseas with our families, we make a lot of sacrifices, um, and sometimes, you know, uh, people tend to forget be that, you know, we're all here, the family is sacrificing as well, not just the officer. And so it's, that is, should be part of the way we have a conversation as a community. Um, so I really appreciate that. And I think that's something that uh, us as the next generation will hope to inculcate also. Um, so one thing I like to ask, um, you know, for you, um, and I think you alluded to it a little bit as, you know, you're, when you're during your first tour in Guangzhou, but in your career um, as, as a woman, as an Asian American, as an immigrant, did you ever feel like whether internally in closed door meetings with our own colleagues or external meetings or events, did you ever feel like because of your identity of who you were, that you were perceived differently or um, some, maybe sometimes your opinion was treated differently because of, you know, your identity? And how did you tackle that? I think that was more of a internal issue that coming from me and yeah. it would be called yes. the imposter syndrome. Yes, that's important. Right? I would mention. often go to meetings and I would not sit at the table. I would just sit in the back row and somebody would say, why don't why? you sit at the table? Um, why not? I just assumed there was somebody more senior there ahead of me. And so for years, I kind of struggled with that. Um, right. Do I belong in that job? How did I get this job? Uh, <laughs> you know, every job has been a challenge. I tell um, fellow officers, don't do take jobs to just to tread water and uh, mm. always challenge yourself. Do something yes. new. Get out of your comfort zone. Yes. Take it to that next level. So I've always, always sought jobs to do uh, that are different and at every mm. step. So... Um, Looking at that, I think making sure that I had the self-confidence to yeah. present myself mm -hmm. uh, and also to 
know your stuff before you walk into a room or meeting. And because whatever initial, again, unconscious bias, not yeah. outright discrimination, yeah. people may have towards you, the minute you start talking and you articulate the substance and the policy, yeah. all that disappears. Right. And even though I still walk into meetings and I mentally make a count, okay, one woman, yeah. three yeah. Uh, I don't think people of color, that <laughs> that's an automatic thing. Yeah, I think yeah. many of us just do. <laughs> yeah. Um, but I use that as an empowerment tool yeah. that I'm here to represent and I'm yes. going to do my best. Yes, absolutely. I think that's excellent. And in fact, it's helped. I mean, I've been into meetings where people, because I'm Asian American, they assume I know more about Asia. Yeah. <laughs> so, You're like, well, and, let me tell you. <laughs> yes, but uh, and I happen to have spent a lot of my career in Asia, so I can share my experiences. Right. Um, or, or they'll assume I'm Chinese from my last name Chung, and, and then I've said I'm Korean. Ooh. And then, uh, then they were very excited about all the kimchi that they've eaten in their lives, and <laughs> we made some connection. <laughs> but all these, again, I don't take offense at it. I think some people take it. Um, too personally, too sensitively. I yeah. think you, you take it openly and warmly and use it as learning opportunities and teaching opportunities. Yeah, I think um, <laughs> that's the kimchi one is just gets me I every said, time. Great, I'm so glad you like kimchi. <laughs> My he, people, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You're like, kimchi is amazing, actually. Um, no, I think that's great. And I think the imposter syndrome topic is so important. Um, it was funny to me, I also as first generation, my parents um, also, when they immigrated to the United States, were working in fast food and, you know, and now here I am. And so I think about that and it's, and then I realize as I've evolved in my career that it's mostly just me looking at other people in the room and assuming they're looking at me as if I don't know what I'm talking about when in actuality it's just my head. Mm -hmm. um, and so it is quite ironic though how I've seen imposter syndrome, um, you know, is a topic that actually is not just to, I thought it was just, you know, like first generation students or like, or, uh, you know, child of immigrants or it was like women like ev like and all level. types yeah. of levels um and so I like to mention that and expound upon it because the more we talk about it the more I think we break it down as and demystify it so it's not just like oh we're sitting in the back of the room hoping that someone realizes that I actually know the most in this room right um so I think that's really great um my last question and then one and I will stop talking and then we can open it to you all um is I I always like to end with um, a forward uh, looking question, which is, and you are in such a unique position to have seen so much um, evolution of the department, but looking forward, you know, maybe the ten, next 10, 20, 30 years, um, how do you think the department could or should do more to maybe uh, to pinpoint exactly what you were talking about earlier, the, the retention aspect of diversity and inclusion in the building? How do we get more folks you know, from what we like to say, the O2 to the O1 to the senior foreign service, like that pipeline, how do we ensure that we're not losing people? What, do, what are your perspectives? I think we've built those right pillars. You know, those uh, st starting st steps are there in the State Department. Again, I know more work has to be done. But yes. with programs like the Pickering and Wrangles, yes. and they're building something similar for the IT, IT um core oh, uh, because we don't have enough people joining State Department for IT because they can get higher pay in, in the private sector. So they're starting a new program just to recruit specifically more people from the IT sector. Oh, wow, excellent. But I think we need diversity across okay. every 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 uh, factor, every uh, area, geographic diversity. We yeah. need more people from places like Guam. Hawaii. And Nebraska. It's not just all California and yeah. New York. Yeah. Um, every kind of diversity that you can think of, you know, the LGBTIQ, whatever uh, differences we have, yeah. that all comes together because we need to reflect what America yes. is to the world. Absolutely. So I think that's very important that we continue that added. I think uh, the director general has been very focused yeah. on this diversity. There's a diversity study that we're doing in the State Department now for the Senior Foreign Service. And uh, again, doing more to make sure that we show and demonstrate uh, we can't say we value diversity if there are no diverse ambassadors or no, no diverse people in the senior foreign service. Absolutely. So we have to show that all the way. Th um, and the importance of it, what's the point of diversity? It's not just so we can have an Asian in the room or yeah. a Hispanic in the room. It's because we can have diversity of thought. Yeah. And I've seen this real life happening um, in my career as I spent most of my career in Asia and just recently moving over to the Western Hemisphere. Mm -hmm. And the reason I was brought over to WHA was to look at the Western Hemisphere 
from more of an Asian angle mm. to look at what are the connections with the Indo-Pacific. Mm. You know, Chile is going to be hosting APEC in yeah. a few weeks. Yeah. Chinese strategic competition is Absolutely. huge in our region. Absolutely. What can we be doing with Taiwan uh, in our region? There are nine countries that recognize Taiwan uh, in the Western Hemisphere. And so there's so much synergy that we haven't mm -hmm. thought of in the past. Mm -hmm. And I feel like that's my value added now. Um, I'm not a Latin Americanist. I've served in Colombia. Uh, but my value that I can bring now is to b bridge those two regions together. Yeah. And that's what diversity of thought is, diversity Absolutely. of backgrounds, diversity of experiences. Yeah, and I think that's that's the that's the sell, right? I think uh, when you look at what 21st century foreign policy challenges that we are either currently facing or will face, the point is that the world, it sounds so... Um, like overused now as a phrase, but the world is seriously so interconnected that if we don't get that diversity of thought from someone who normally maybe serves in one region going to the other region and looking at it and saying, oh, wow. Like, for example, I come from a Middle East South Asia experience. And then when I first served in Asia issues in the last couple of years, I was like, oh, my God, there are so many similarities. This is astounding. Um, and so that is so important. It's there's actually the causal linkage there of diversity of of different types of people in diversity of thought and actually more productive and and fruitful foreign policy solutions um, to our most important challenges. So I think that's great. I'm going to stop talking now. And there I know there's so many people in the room who would love to ask some questions to our amazing speaker. So um, as mentioned, just wait for the mic and um, and then we'll go from there. Yes. Um, hi, uh, once again, my name is Jennifer Cardoza. I'm visiting here from Johns Hopkins Science. And um, just, I'm really excited to just have an opportunity to ask you this question. I think um, coming from a, sim a background, um, a Latin American and Asian background, um, it's just awesome to have you in the room and, and just pick your brain on what are some issues mm. um, between the two areas and, and opportunities uh, to be able to, I think you mentioned some earlier, but um, I would love to, uh, hear your opinion on other ideas and other bridges of, you know, communication between the two uh, areas. Mm. Um, yeah, yeah, great. <laughs> Uh, as I said, there's so much synergy between the two regions. And uh, initially, I studied Spanish, actually, at UC San Diego and Japanese. Studied abroad in um, Japan, I said, but also studied for a summer in Spain. And then I went as a volunteer to El Salvador uh, for a couple of weeks. So having seen those two regions, um, and many times in the State Department, there's a stove piping of, of the regional bureaus. Uh, the Asia Bureau goes this way, Latin, you know, Western Hand <laughs> goes this way, Europe goes this way, and never never do those meet. Yes. Um, but I think we're learning. I think we're now learning that you know the China strategic competition is not an Asia problem just for the EAP Bureau, the Asia Bureau. Uh, when we look at China and their actions right now in the world, not only in terms of debt diplomacy, uh, which that's happening throughout the region in the Caribbean and South America and Central America, uh, but in terms of human rights. Yeah. And we see this, the stark differences of China's way of handling human rights and the rest of the world and the like-minded countries that we are mm -hmm. uh, allied with. So in terms of Xinjiang, uh, the, those things that we want to bring to light. And recently we had the UN General Assembly and I led the Western Hemisphere Bureau delegation there. And it was so exciting to see us not just talking to Western Hemisphere countries, but mm. I met my counterparts from Japan and Korea mm. to talk about what we can do together with like-minded partners in the region. Mm. I think that's the piece that's been missing. We try to do everything ourselves, the United <laughs> States. Uh, you know, it's like the type A and me. I just want to get the work done myself. Yeah. <laughs> but we forget our allies with yeah. resources, with ideas. Uh, and so just one example was in Paraguay. Paraguay is a, a country that recognizes Taiwan, uh, where we brought together resources from OPEC, mm -hmm. from the United States and Taiwan, and joined up with Paraguay and did a women's empowerment program. It was small, but it was very symbolic to show that we can do things together mm -hmm. with our allies in the region. Um, just this week in the Caribbean, my colleagues are in the Caribbean doing a Caribbean Resilience Disaster uh, Conference. So how to help the Caribbean countries counter uh, a lot of the hurricanes, disaster issues. Mm. And again, not just looking to the freebies and the easy money that China offers, but what can we do to provide technical assistance that's accountable, that's transparent, based on good governance. Yeah. I mean, that that's a stark choices. It's not a choice of choose us versus China. No, we, we have relationships with China. We have trade with China. 
But when you look at what's being offered, the values underpinning uh, economic or political arrangements, we want countries, our friends and neighbors, to look at that in, in a very clear-eyed way. Yeah, great. Yeah, great. Ms. Chong, thank you so much for taking the time. I'm curious, you mentioned that of your original 10 Pickering uh, Fellows mm -hmm. cohort, there's only two or three of you left. Mm -hmm. You've also talked about the dwindling uh, um, representation of diverse um, uh, officers as you um, go up the ranks in the State Department. I'm curious to know what kept you in the State Department in this career over the 20 years you've worked um, at State, and if there's anything you've learned as a, either as a, an Asian American, as a woman, as an officer in general, that has helped you develop the connections that you needed to succeed in your career and navigate your identity as a minority in an institution that's, especially when you entered, was largely not represented by someone who looked at you or, or came from your it's background. It's still very pale male Yale. <laughs> it's okay to say that. That's a term. Don't worry. Yes. Um, Just less so. Every day is not cocktails and rainbows and unicorns. I'll, <laughs> I'll tell you that. I've been in 23 years. Uh, there are tough days. There are frustrating days. There are days I just want to throw out my Blackberry. Yes, we still use a Blackberry. <laughs> um, Single-handedly keeping them alive. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> but I remind myself, back to the basics, why did I choose this career in the first place? Right. I wanted to serve my country, period. And I didn't say, I want to serve my country until it gets hard. I want to serve my country unless I don't get a promotion or the job I want. I want to serve my country unless everybody in the world respects and loves the work that I do. I want to serve my country until the going gets tough. I want to serve my country, period. And that's what I pledge to. And so even on the tough days, I remind myself why I love this job and, and why diplomacy matters. More than ever in this day and age, diplomacy matters. I know there's a lot of different headlines out there right now, but if you can see what I see from inside the building, the millions, the millions of things that happen every day around the world in our embassies, consulates, and the bureau here, uh, and the various bureaus here. We are getting diplomacy done. We are making huge successes. And just two examples, I mean, just yesterday, Under Secretary Kroc announced the U.S. was pledging $1.2 billion for sustainable fishing and marine debris. Did you see that in the news? No. Uh, a month ago at the U.N. General Assembly, we got 16 countries of the Rio Treaty to sign up and pledge for a collective diplomatic and economic action against the Maduro regime to end that brutal regime and the torture and extrajudicial killings that are happening there. Did you hear much about that in the news? We have diplomacy successes every day, and I'm so excited that I get to come in and do that every day. Yeah, that's great. Um, questions? We have some on this side, so we'll just go down. Thank you. Thank you, P. Dash Chung, for coming to speak with us today. Um, I have two questions, so I can, can Just I ask? go them? ahead, yeah. Okay. Um, my first question, how has your experience engaging with foreign policy and being a diplomat impacted your view of the American dream? Mm -hmm. um, I know your first response, you talked about your parents and you immigrating here to the U.S., so has that has your view changed at all, and if so, how? And my second question is, with so many experiences and um, in the Foreign Service and prior to the Foreign Service and your background as a woman and an Asian American, how has um, how have you been able to articulate, or early on in your career, how were you able to articulate your value added? Mm -hmm. um, and and what, how were you able to narrow down all of your experiences and bring in your background to present the value that you added to the work that you were doing or to the embassy mm -hmm. at which you were serving? Thank you. Can you just give it to her and then just, yeah. When I was in Vietnam, in Hanoi, Vietnam, I was a public affairs officer, the deputy public affairs officer, and I often went out to meet with university students. That was the favorite part of my job, going out and just talking to university students and telling them repeatedly my story, about my immigrant story and my family story. And every time, it just it brought such a response and um, such an emotional response from the crowds. Again, they, they were starving for stories like that, that that really exists. And, for me to tell them that I'm an example of an immigrant who would become an American diplomat, um, that is our, one of our success stories. And one of the things that I feel as an as a Asian American and an immigrant and a woman that I can bring to that table. 
And years later, I was in Cambodia, and a Vietnamese diplomat came up to me and said, hi, you don't know me, Ms. Chung, but I know you. And I said, oh, really? He said, years ago, when you were in Vietnam, you came to my school, and you talked about your immigration experience and being a diplomat, and it made me want to become a diplomat in the Vietnamese Ministry of Foreign Affairs. And now I'm a diplomat. And, and that really was the first time that it clicked about the importance of not only public diplomacy, but what that means as a diplomat, when you connect one-on-one -on -one with somebody, yeah. and you don't even know you're doing it. And we, again, we do speaking events all the, all time, the time, that one of the thousands of speaking events that I did, that I don't remember in Vietnam, somebody heard something and it clicked and inspired them to follow a certain career track. I love that. I love that we can make a difference like that. I didn't solve, you know, world nuclear uh, crises, <laughs> but I connected with somebody and you make a difference in their lives. And that's the value of diplomacy, I think. People always think, well, what peace treaty, you know, did you yes. uh, negotiate or what free trade agreement did you sign? It's not all about that. It's not just about the bottom line results. It's the people to people connections. And that is so undervalued. I think we need to think about, about how we renew that. Uh, and that's a value added. And I forgot your first question. The American, the American dream. <laughs> the American yeah. dream story. So, yeah, as I said, I, I get teary-eyed every time I talk about my dad and my mom. And, you know, I shouldn't be here, right? My parents were children during the Korean War. They fled, holding on to the back of a train to fled south during a war-torn war country. Um, my grandmother got split uh, from her husband, so we never saw my grandfather. He, she never saw her, her husband. So my father was a small child when he never saw his father again. And and then to immigrate to the United States. So there are many factors to where my family got here and I don't take anything for granted. Mm. That's why every day is a blessing and every day you just take as an as a enrichment mm. and how do you pay that forward? Yeah, exactly. That's great. Hi. Hi. Yeah. Um, so my question is a little bit about the sac sacrifices you make, um, especially for your family. Mm -hmm. um, and so uh, I think Charlena put it when you join, your family also kind of joins into the Foreign Service. And I think that's um, really difficult for women to navigate when um, there isn't so much of a historical or cultural um, precedent for men having to make sacrifices for their wives', wives careers yeah. or um, women putting maybe their careers ahead of their family at some times. Um, and I've heard from people in the past say, you know, it's it's constantly a compromise. Sometimes you take jobs that aren't going to make yep. you um, get a promotion, but yep. it's what's best for your family. Mm -hmm. How have you navigated this? Is there any specific resource or strategy mm. that you've found useful um, to either, you know, sometimes get your family on board, get your mm -hmm. kids on board? What's your rationale? Excellent question. It's constant communication with your family and realistic expectations. Um, and I tell this to tandem couples and in the Foreign Service or couples where one is outside the State Department and one is within. You have to be very clear going in that this yeah. is not going to be easy. And there will be times when, as you said, you're going to have to take jobs that you know, they may not necessarily advance your career, but that's better for your family. And I, I've seen that. I've seen that every day. Right now, it's called bidding season. Everyone's yeah. bidding on jobs. And we have people giving me feedback. I would love to take that job, but my child has asthma or my husband can't get a job there. And I, I'm fully understanding of that. There are times that you know, we want certain jobs, but we have to take care of our families first. I have a very supportive and understanding husband. Um, as he described it, he has jobs, not a career. Mm -hmm. And he is basically um, everywhere we've gone from place to place has found a job mm -hmm. and found something to keep him you know, busy and creative and engaged. But he doesn't have a career built built up like uh, like I do, and so he's done everything from working for a regulatory firm to American Chamber of Commerce wow. to a job at an embassy working in public affairs to documentary filmmaking. You know, jack of all trades, wow. and so he's learned to adapt and try to find jobs wherever that can. Is that easy, especially for a male spouse? No, and so I'm trying to then be understanding of his needs and be communicative. And every time before I select an assignment, even on, even within domestic assignments, before I took this job, we had a long talk about how this, we're going to make this work as a family. Yeah. And I wanted to add one thing, which is so great to have someone like Pete S. Chung at the leadership level who's setting the example, um, is that in the rest of the department, I think we're finally at a point where there are enough women who are professional women navigating this issue. And so we're just, we talk about it more out in the open, just like what Pete S. Chung says, where she 
goes into the room and she'll just be like, guys, today I'm tired. My kid kept me up all night. Like that is, it sounds so simple, but actually has so much meaning because just, and I think this is once again, not just the State Department or the even, you know, foreign affairs community. This is just a generational shift, which is normalizing our families, whether you're single, whether you're married, whatever your situation is, mentioning your personal life in the professional realm is not only okay, it's welcome. And, and, and especially in the foreign service where sometimes we are all out there together and sometimes even living in close quarters with each other, um, you know, it is actually sometimes an asset to acknowledge, uh, you know, and be humble about the challenges. And I think even in my own career over the past like nine years, I've, I've been so happy to see so much more women just talking about it like, oh, your struggle is my struggle. Like your husband is a PhD in nuclear physics, so I don't really know what he's going to do in X country. And it's OK to just openly say that and then have a conversation about it. So I think that's also so heartening to see that change and shift. And again, I think the department over the years that I've seen, we didn't have an executive women at state group where right. the women get together. And I just spoke at the, on that panel. Yeah. We have diversity councils yeah. almost in every bureau. Uh, we hold brown brag bags on unconscious bias, how to try to balance work life and how to address a promotion, um, d different rates of promotion for, for cones. All these issues that affect us in our professional and personal lives, now we're able to openly discuss that. Uh, and, and again, in WHA, we had recently had a brown bag on why words matter. And it was a safe place where people can talk about you know, what affects them. And so I think there's more of that, certainly than when I started 23 years ago. And that's a recognition of the department that this is not just a monolithic place where we're just doing policy. It's a place where we're, we spend most of our time in the office than at home. So this is our second home. Exactly. How do we nurture our people? How do we exactly. try to address all these things that we're trying to juggle in our lives? Um, and the, one of the earlier questions I was asking you about, like, what keeps you in, you know, after 23 years, I thought about that question and I was thinking, you know, one more thing that I, I almost feel like is relevant for you and I'm not you, so, but I'm, so I'm putting words almost in your mouth, but is because of how you have set an example for others, now when I'm looking at this question, I feel like now I have a responsibility um, with my own mid-level colleagues and those junior, you know, coming in after me to have those conversations very actively to set an example that, you know, our personal lives and how we navigate this very difficult sacrifice is okay. And so that is also part of mentorship and that is also part of a responsibility I feel that I have to to provide the next generation a realistic and an and important understanding of the challenges and the great things that we that we do every day. And I love this institution, this institution of the State Department and the institution of diplomacy. It is something that, again, I say I, every morning I wake up and I walk through those doors and sometimes it's, the sun is not up yet, but I'm very excited to be there <laughs> <laughs> with my double espresso. Um, and one day at our staff meeting, I handed out little pink cards to everybody and I asked everybody to write resilience on one side and then flip it over and write three things that keep them resilient. Hmm. Um, again, resilience is not a word we talked about when yeah. I joined the Foreign Service. And then just keep that card in your desk. You don't have to share it with anybody and just remind yourself. And I, I keep that card too. And so what keeps you resilient during the yeah. tough days, during the yeah. frustrating days, days that you want to give up? Yeah. And each person is going to be different. For me, it's my family, it's my son, it's our new rescue dog. <laughs> um, it's my faith. You know, I'm a Christian and my family is deeply embedded in, in our faith and what that means to be a Christian uh, and how that marries up with the values of my job. Yeah. I think about that and that's what keeps me resilient. Yeah. That is amazing. That's a great. That's a great example. Okay, we have a question back here. If we still have it. Oh, great. Oh, she's already proactively answering questions, and then we'll go to this side. Hello. Um, once again, thanks for coming. This has been really, really insightful on a lot of levels. Um, I think you mentioned that you entered state in 1996. Yes. At that time. Um, Obviously, since then, just around issues of LGBT, mm -hmm. this country has seen a tremendous shift. I think a lot of us would probably say in the right direction. Um, and, I'm, and I'm just curious what what you've witnessed at the State Department, particularly mm -hmm. in that realm of yeah. diversity in yeah. the, that 25, yeah. 20, what, however, years. So, yeah. much, so much change, I'm sure. My first boss in the Foreign Service and U.S. Consulate Guangzhou was a Consulate General, Ed McKeon. 
And he's a guy who was just very jolly, you know, big belly, you know, white hair, kind of like Santa, Santa. Claus. <laughs> I was like Santa and, Claus. Um, <laughs> and his partner was a big, burly African-American man, right? And they were just a wonderful host, a wonderful, he was a wonderful diplomat, and his spouse followed him wherever he could. And uh, they always seemed very content in the way they were in the State Department family. Years later, he told me it was a struggle for many, many years because his spouse was not allowed to officially yeah. be recognized as a spouse. Um, at what point? At one point in his passport, he had to be listed as household help yeah. to be able to accompany him to trips. And I can't imagine, and That's still in the thing. decades before him, yeah. what they had to face as an interracial mm. couple in the State Department. And you go to countries where they don't recognize that. Yeah. So I feel like we have come a long way and we have tried to be supportive. The institution has been trying to be supportive of same-sex couples. And then later, you know, the happy story was they're able to go on and adopt two boys, one from Japan and one from China. So wow. that's a modly family picture, uh, two Asian boys, African-American and a Caucasian man. And that's America. Yeah. And that's something that they could proudly display. But I think there are still challenges, of course, and, in, and especially in those countries that yeah. um, don't recognize rights or don't accept uh, same-sex couples um, at their posts, and I hope we continue to fight for that. So Can, I think and maybe you could elaborate. I think some of the folks in the room are probably not aware of some of the legal issues in certain countries. But I think, in general, I, I you know it is still important to note that for same-sex couples around the world, um, you know, depending on the country, it's almost like an impossible battle to, we have tried so hard in, I mean, almost every country in the world to negotiate these things. Um, but it's hard for them to get visas, like on the, in their diplomatic passport that say that they're the partner, right? And, um, and I think it goes back to, once again, um, in my mind, uh, the diversity and inclusion angle, because if we don't understand um, from different perspectives that some of these countries, you know, we have to make a choice of how far we want to negotiate where they're like, for example, parts of the Middle East, like almost a losing game. Um, they're not going to change their rules, but what can we do as an institution to do better to take care of our people? And I think, at least in my experience, it, because I joined, you know, uh, in the last 10 years, I, I just was lucky and blessed to come in in the time where this was just normalized. This is how we do business. And so that's one of the many uh, great assets of the State Department Foreign Service. I have never experienced a time, I mean, I have my own friends who, when you're, a, when you're a Foreign Service officer, most people know in their first two tours, you are directed. I mean, you give your preferences and you just hope for the best, right? And so I had a colleague who had with his Japanese uh, American partner, he was heading out to an, a, a very anti-LGBTQI country in Africa, and but he was directed there, and he just told his, um, you know, our what we say our CDO, he, I can't go there, and he could have, I mean, they could have just been like, you're going there, right? But they not only did they not do that, our assistant secretary at the time, um, a famous woman named Linda Thomas Greenfield, um, she not only was like, this is terrible for you, you will not go there. She actively found a job for them in Africa where they would be able to go together. And that is to me leadership. That is, it, it can't be done for everyone, right? Um, but I think this is, that to me was, this is how the department takes care of our people. We can't change norms and cultural issues and countries and diplomatically there's so much more at stake then you have to balance all those things as senior leaders, I can only imagine. But I think that it, that story is so important because we as people can do a lot to take care of each other. And so that, I just wanted to expound upon that. Um, yes, we had a next question. Yes, if I may, I'm gonna I have two questions, one more general and a, a more specific one. On a general basis, a lot of us are heading into the Foreign Service in the next year or two. Um, sort of, if you could go back in time, what would you tell yourself right before entering the foreign service? Sort of advice <laughs> for everyone else. On a more specific level, um, as a future public diplomacy officer, I see such high value in how we paint our picture and narrate our message to local audiences abroad, especially given the information age. However, as you mentioned before, a lot of people in DC um, oftentimes want results. And it's so mm. hard sometimes for um, 
the public diplomacy section to prove results or show results, um, what can we do more as an institution to sort of value the work of uh, public diplomacy in the future? Mm -hmm. Qualitative versus quantitative. Yeah, yeah, it's true, and that's a struggle. I mean, right now we are very focused on data analytics. Yes. You know, we can't be just doing programs endlessly without showing results. So it is very important. Um, I think there should be a balance of showing the real life story results of, in terms of how it affects people's influencing their opinions of the United States or how they react to us. At the same time, trying to quantify that in actual numbers. Um, but that is something that the State Department is very focused on right now in terms of data. And so even in public diplomacy or in economic reporting or in political, uh, we do seek to get as much data as possible that's out there. Um, and I don't think that's a bad thing. I think we should reflect on that and see how we can as best as, as ourselves assess with different measures, numbers, with anecdotal ev evidence, whatever, how do we describe that success? And uh, your first question was if you could go back in time. Time machine, oh. Time machine question, watch um, more LA law. <laughs> I know, be careful of that haircuts from the 90s. Um, <laughs> uh, I would tell myself, take myself a little less seriously. Yeah. Uh, you know, as a very type A immigrant Asian American, um, everything was always so serious and so intense and had to get that job and had to get that best EER. And then the first time when I didn't get promoted the first round, that was devastating. That was like the equivalent of not getting into Georgetown. And I was on the wait list here. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, still impacts me. I have PTSD being here today. <laughs> Okay. I like how you just, just yeah. that, that buried the lead I, <laughs> I went to Columbia instead, so Georgetown oh, had its oh, chance. Oh my goodness. But, uh, but yeah, just knowing that, you know, things may not happen exactly at the right time, at the right way that you want it to be, and that's okay. Yeah. Uh, other doors open, other paths open. Again, I thought I would be in the Asia Bureau forever. Uh, never in a million years, if you had asked me two years ago, that I would be the principal deputy assistant secretary in the Western Hemisphere, what I have said, that's even a possibility. So be open, yeah. be open-minded and enjoy the ride and have fun. And yeah, and be easy on yourself. Yeah. I think that's, that's great. I wish I had that when I started. Um, and last but not least, our last question. Yeah. <laughs> um, so from all of your experiences and all of your posts, um, which one, or can you tell us a story from one that's kind of been more resonating or one of your most impactful experiences? Ooh. It's hard to pick just yeah, one. So many amazing um, tours. It's hard to pick just one. I would say probably Cambodia. Um, that was very impactful. As a deputy chief of mission, it was my first time being a DCM. And that's kind of like the job I have now. You're the deputy, so you're the COO. You're the chief operating officer. Yeah. You keep everything running, the whole building, all the interagencies. You manage the ambassador. You manage everybody else. And then similar in my, in my role now in the bureau. Um, but I loved that experience within the building because it was a chance for me to really learn outside of my specific cone of economics or public diplomacy job and learn about how it all fits together. It is, this is when the light bulb went on for me in my career. It's just, wow, this is how we all fit together, one team, one mission. Yeah. And so having that overview was, was really rewarding. Outside the building, uh, working with human rights groups and civil rights groups that I still follow and track on, on social media was very impactful. Um, there was one incident when a very famous um, human rights activist was shot dead in the middle of the day in a gas station, you know, a couple of miles away from my home. It was devastating for the whole country. And uh, we had the Assistant Secretary for Human Rights visit the country to attend that funeral where I accompanied him. And to be able to, you know, explain to, to his family uh, and to others in that community why we, the United States, are here for them. And we will never fail. We will seek to get justice and help advocate for justice, that was really impactful. Um, and it made me feel like we're doing good in the world. Uh, we're not perfect as a nation. Not every policy and everything we say and do is perfect. But the values and principles and core things that we believe in as a nation, it is so important to get that message out there. And I am one of the tools, one of the vehicles to get that out. And so this is my appeal. We need more of you. We need more diplomats from all backgrounds. The time is now more than ever. Mm. Diplomacy matters and we need the best people. And we need people who are passionate about not just traveling and learning languages, but as I went back to originally to service, that you're here to serve your country and in whatever circumstance that may be.
Well, that's an excellent way to wrap up. Thank you, everyone, and thank you, of thank course, Peter Chung, for wonderful. being here. So thank you so much. Thanks, everybody.